Hello, everybody. Welcome to your very favorite Bronze Age Spider-Man podcast. Here comes the Spider-Cast. I am your co-host, Mike L., and as always, I'm joined by... Joshua Mervell and... Happy New Year, everyone. Today, we're going to be looking at Spider-Man <laughs> comics from January of 1984. That's right. This is, again, I mean, I bought my first Spidey comic in 82, but this was around where I started to get more. So we are once again joined by our special <laughs> guest, the producer of the comic book syndicate, G.I. Jolie. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Oh, sh- <laughs> oh what's this? It's my it's my New Year ring in. Oh, is that, is that what that was? Okay. It's my air horn. Nice. Just trying to ring it in right. Yeah. This is gonna be this is gonna be a big year in Spidey history. So um, we got a, we got a lot of cool things coming up for those that read. You better Spider-Man. keep that air horn out, Jolie. Yep. We're gonna be we're using, using it all lot. year. But for <laughs> but coming up in 1984, we're gonna have the black costume. We're gonna have Secret Wars. We're gonna have a new writer on Spidey, a new artist, like a bunch mm. of new really cool things coming up. So, yeah, we're kicking it into high gear now, right? Right. The yeah, because uh, for, for those of you who might be joining us on this episode, each episode we try to go through and read one month worth of Spidey comics. We've started all the way back from 1980, and we've made it to uh, January of 1984. So, um, theoretically, next episode would be February of 84, and then... March and April and May, we would go on from there until we've read all of the 80s Spider-Man comics. Right. And then in between, we also cover, um, we have episodes dedicated to crossovers like guest appearances and the Avengers or Marvel 2-in-1 or whatever. Right. And then once in a while, we'll even do a cartoon review of the 80s cartoon or the 90s cartoon. So there's always yeah. something different, right? Speaking yeah, of exactly. something different, yeah, this, <laughs> this week uh, is really different. <sighs> So this is going back to a time when I think comics, uh, Marvel comics were a little bit more fun. Could be wrong. But this is something called Assistant Editors Month. So everyone's heard of crossovers and you've heard of theme months at like DC usually. This was the theme month where supposedly all of the Marvel editors went to, I think it was, I think it was the, was it, it was, was it the, the San Diego Comic Con, was it? Yeah, it was some oh, sort oh. of like Comic Con um, right. like comic book convention that they'd all went to. So, Right. And so the joke was, was that the assistant editors took over that month. Now, I really don't know the dynamics of how the office worked at Marvel Comics. I don't know how, I mean, sure. I mean, of course this was played up. It was a joke, right? But they'd stamp this logo on the cover of almost every Marvel comic saying, warning, you know, this is assistant editors month. And a lot of <laughs> Uh, you know, for example, the Avengers a guest appeared on David Let- the David Letterman show, you know, Late Night with David Letterman. And uh, other comics had all these, you know, different wacky things going on. In Spider-Man, you'll see that one of the comics we're reviewing um, has Aunt May teamed up with Galactus. <laughs> and then uh, another one has a guest artist or a guest appearance by artist uh, Fred Hembeck. This one, Amazing Spider-Man, is not – is actually – not only is it a serious issue, it's arguably the most serious issue. So I'm gonna t- I'm gonna uh, sum this up quickly. It's a it's a it's an it's a rare issue with two different stories in it, two completely different stories. The first part is by the regular team of Roger Stern and John Romita Jr. and it's basically just capping off uh, last month's story where Thunderball from the Wrecking Crew had um, uh, found his old wrecking ball as well as the crowbar used by the wrecker so now he's kind of like twice as powerful and so you know not much of a story it's basically just spider-man and um thunderball fighting for about 10 pages Mm -hmm. uh not a spectacular story but as the ending of another story i thought it was fine we could talk about this one quickly on its own first sure Um, yeah john do you have anything special to say about the story or um I don't think anything special, really. Uh, again, it, it doesn't feel like its own story. It really right. is just kind of like the ending of another one. So it's hard to even talk about the story that's happening here because there's not. Right. Um, we pick up where we left off last issue and they, they just start fighting. And um, Spider-Man ends up defeating him and, and it ends there. Uh, I will say, though, I did enjoy that um, Spider-Man actually like took the crowbar from him. And was fighting him with like his own weapon, 
right. then um, I, I also really love when Spider-Man uses his smarts to uh, defeat a foe rather than just right. punching him out and, and having the issue end right away. Um, right. Having, you know, him think about how he can, um, you know, uh, connect his webs to this generator and then, you know, throw the crowbar back at him and have him catch it. And when it does, it c- finishes the circuit and it kind of like makes a bomb go off pretty much. And right, that's right. how he ends up defeating Very him. Like, smart. So yep. it, it's fun. Yeah, it's it's a uh, it's it's a fun little like half okay. issue. And, and I think a pretty good end to the story from from last week. So, yeah, it was it was good. But I, I will say, though, I think that it's, it's not a story. It's not right. a story at all. It's it's um, I wouldn't recommend it on its own. I would recommend it together with the last issue. Right, right. Uh, Gia Jolie, how do you feel about this one? Yeah, it's. I agree with Josh. It's just like a non-story. It's kind of like, it's kind of like where I expected the story from the last issue to go when they first showed us. He's like, "I'm Thunderball," and it just like ends. Right. But he's got the wrecking bar and his wrecking ball, and he, um, you know, they couldn't just like mm, shoehorn that into the end of the last book. I don't. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they could have, yeah. I mean, unfortunately, if this was published in 2020, this would be the whole issue. There would be no other story, and then you'd just be expected to pick up the next ongoing chapter in the never-ending story of whatever character you're reading, right? Back then, yeah. this was a rarity, though. Yeah, I mean, he does some weird stuff, um, mm-hmm. but uh, again, I agree. It was nice to see him use his brains to right. outsmart um, the, the, the criminal element um, and that's always something that I really kind of like to see in superhero books is like when they don't rely or they rely on a mix of their brains and their superpowers to overcome um, some kind of circumstance with a foe. It was right. really cool. And it's like, I don't know if that would work. And I, don't I mean, know the if... art, I mean, as always is great. It's John Romita Jr. again. So, I mean, there's not really much to say. It's kind of the standard, you know, awesome classic Marvel art of this period by John Romita Jr., um yeah sorry, i mean ahead. it's like yeah it's standard there's nothing mm-hmm. really like to say about it it just works when it works and it works when it doesn't work it's mm-hmm. just like you know it's it's probably a little bit more crowded maybe because they were squeezing in maybe a little bit too much story than they had room for so it's a little bit more dense than i'm used to with uh, john romita jr but other yeah. than that yeah but yeah, definitely a standard uh, standard superhero story. Now, this issue is split into two, as we said. And so now we're going to talk about the cover. On the cover, we've got a boy holding up a poster of the fight scene between Spider-Man and Thunderball. And then we've got Spider-Man's hand on the boy's shoulder. And the boy is looking back. And at the bottom, it says, in this issue, meet the kid who collects Spider-Man. So now we're going to talk about this rather famous story so in this story um we have a basically in the place of narration we have a newspaper article that peter parker is reading we don't know that yet but it's written by a guy named jacob conover and he's uh, a reporter writing a story about a boy he's met named timothy harrison and as we're reading the story uh in these little like pieces of newspaper we we have the um Like that's, I guess you could call it a flashback or whatever you want to call it. But this is, so we're in the story and we have Spider-Man coming into this bedroom of this boy who's like in bed. And, um, you know, he kind of leaps down and he starts talking to this kid and joking around with him and, you know, picking up his bed and holding it over his head. And basically this kid just really wants to meet Spider-Man. And that's what this newspaper article tells us. And so Spider-Man you know, um, also finds out that this kid collects Spider-Man memorabilia. And so the ongoing plot of this story is the kid showing him all the things he's got. Like one of the things is like a reel of film of Spider-Man fighting and then all these newspaper clippings, who is Spider-Man. And we get a chance for Spider-Man to recap his origin, which is kind of cool. He's ex- So Spider-Man's explaining how his powers work. He's making a little swing set made out of webs so the kid can swing on it. And, um, you know, there's also a point where Sp- uh, Spider-Man's kind of down on himself because he, re- he reveals his origin about what happened with Uncle Ben. And mm. he doesn't say his Uncle Ben's name, but he kind of is a little bit down on himself. And the kid's like, hey, 
you know, uh, you know, don't be so hard on yourself. I know you messed up, but at least you've tried to make up for it. So the kid is actually giving Spider-Man some good advice, right? So then, you know, it goes on and, you know, he's talking about some bullets that he collected from a wall after, after Spider-Man was shot up by some bad guys. And that's pretty much it. And Spider-Man's like, well, you know what? I got to get going. It was nice to meet you, but, you know, it's time for you to get some sleep. So he's walking out the door and he opens up the window. And then the kid's like, Spider-Man? He's like, yes, will you tell me who you really are? And Spider-Man's like, well, how can I do that? I mean, I can't reveal my identity. And the kid is like, uh, I'd never tell another soul that I knew as long as I lived, honest. And Spider-Man's like, I believe you, Tim, but I, I can't. I just... So then he walks over to the window. And then with the light coming through, he pulls his mask off and he turns around. And he says, my name is Peter Parker. I took most of the photos that go with those articles. So he reveals... Um, how Peter Parker gets away with taking all these great photos of Spider-Man. And then he sits down and they talk for a little bit. And he's like, and the, and the kid's like, well, it's our secret forever and ever. I promise. Yeah, I guess that makes us buddies then. You bet, Pete. Buddies to the end. And he's like, okay, well, I got to get going. And so Spider-Man puts his mask back on and he swings outside. And just as he's leaving, we see a little sign that says, uh, Slocum brewer cancer clinic and then we find out in the article that the kid only has a few weeks to live and so that's why spider-man revealed his identity um huh. so gi julie I, I, I want to start with you um this is probably your first time reading this story so what do you think of it well um i thought it was one of the uh, assistant editor offerings and that's why it was kind of there was a more serious turn or note mm -hmm. um and like kind of a departure from your regular um, baddie of the month book, um, which is a good thing. So I really enjoyed the story, except for the fact that the <laughs> survival rate of childhood leukemia is 98%. So, I mean, I don't want to say wow, that, <laughs> I don't want to say that Peter made a bad decision revealing his alter ego to him but I well no the, the doctors only gave him a few weeks to live so we yeah. have to accept that in this story the kid is gonna die i know but still mm -hmm. <laughs> i'm just saying it's like the it, it's no it's it's definitely not demon in a bottle it's it's touching in a good way um mm -hmm. i don't know how to yeah i just I had to think about this story for a couple seconds because mm. initially I was angry that it was an origin recap mm. initially. And it was like, Oh, okay. But for some re but I, I kept reading and the reading, the reading of the writing <laughs> was good. The writing mm. is really good. Mm -hmm. um, and it made me wonder why the rest of what I've read from quote, Peter Parker's life <laughs> hasn't been this good up until now. Like, why Why is it this issue that they've chosen this kind of a departure? So, Well, uh, I, that's a good question. Maybe maybe it is because they didn't have to squeeze a supervillain into this story, right? They could just do this little short story about... Yeah, well, they really... They, they, they squeezed... They To me, they kind of ruined the book as a whole, the issue. Um, they could have just done this story mm -hmm. they always come back to um they always come back to st old storylines they could have just left thunderball and done this issue and then come back to thunderball like next issue uh i guess so but i i, I, I feel like they could ahead. have even um had them mesh together a little bit more like uh -huh. Like, you could even have Spider-Man telling the kid what happened at the end of the fight. So that way, like, it feels more part of the story. It doesn't, it's not, like, mm -hmm. separate. So, because the, that's, this story, I don't think is very consequential. The, the Thunderball one, right? Like, it's, yeah. that story is just going to end. It's not really connected to the greater story that's going on. So they could have just ended that story with Peter Parker recalling what happened to the little boy. Because he wants to, you know, hear uh, his, like, what he's doing on his newest ad adventure. And, you know, his newest, like, uh, bad guy he's defeated. And, and well, if they would have just made the issue about 
just about this, I think it would have been so strong. I, I think it was strong on its own, but it's mm-hmm. it wasn't as great as it could have been, I think. Yeah, because I, mean, I just, as much as you want to get the tie between the Thunderball story and then him moving on to this, it, that's just not a strong enough tie. Mm. Well, I it, would say that there is no tie because it's two yeah. separate stories, you know? And I think the fact that it's even two different artists separates it even more. Like, I honestly don't even associate the two. Like, th- this, the second story could have taken place any time, right? It doesn't have to, there's no connection to the ongoing subplots. Right. So. And, well, that's and, and, what I'm, that, well, that's what I said initially. Like, they could have just de- deliberately, since this is a line-wide, quote, joke, they could have just used this issue as, like, a one-off into the assistant editor well, thing okay. that they've been talking about. Okay, but rather, rather than talking about the format of this magazine, let's just talk about the story itself. Because this story has been reprinted many times on its own, mm-hmm. like in isolation from this. So we don't need to worry about the Thunderball story or any of that stuff or the ongoing subplots. But let's just talk about this story itself. Um, one of the things okay. that's, that's different is the artist is different. Um, I'm not sure if you guys noticed, but what was your first impression, G.I. Julie, of Ron Frenz's artwork? I hate it. <laughs> I don't like it. I don't uh, like the way he... Okay. No, go ahead. I just don't like the way he um, does Spider-Man's costume, I guess. It's really... Uh, it's bad. Well, let me just give some context. Uh, he's deliberately imitating Steve Ditko, the way he drew Spider-Man. And one of the things Steve Ditko did was he drew Spider-Man's webs in the opposite direction that John Romita Sr. did. So John Romita Sr. made them go, made them dip down, and Steve Ditko made them curve up. And it's just off-putting. And um, I think the thing is, though, they, throughout the comic, they swap from being down and up. They Actually, do. You know I'm looking you know, at yeah. a panel right now. Wow, where I just noticed that. Yep, you're right. Yeah, page nine specifically, like you can see it kind of popping up and down. Yeah. Like, yeah. They swap. So regardless, yeah, regardless of a callback to whatever he's doing, if he's paying homage to Steve Ditko, it, like to me, like I as a reader who may may or may not follow, um, or someone who's trying to recommend this to somebody, if the art's bad, it's bad. Like mm-hmm. the texture, it's really funny how when you invert um, like a line, how it could suggest even a different texture to like the fabric. Like when you do it the mm. way that he's done it here, it looks like knit. Uh huh. So, well, yeah. Well, here, I just want to say one quick thing. Um, if we go to dig, uh, sorry, original page nine, digital 21, because they, they start the numbering over, but <laughs> now you guys see that page, right? Mm-hmm. So Spidey in the top left corner looks terrible. That's a terrible image. Uh, yeah. The two middle images are okay of him by the window. Now, when he takes off his mask, I think Spider-Man himself looks great. The kid looks terrible. It looks He looks like he's drawn by Mark Bagley, which is not a compliment. And that's kind of a tangent line with his chin touching the bottom of the um, yeah the panel. It's it's not a great panel. And that, that to me, just shows like that's just poor poorly drawn. However, if you go to the very next page... I think the way that he does Peter Parker's face is excellent. Like when Peter Parker is talking to the kid, especially in the bottom panel when he's hugging him, I think that is an excellent, um, it's kind of like Ditko-esque, but a little bit more modern. And that's an example of, I think, of a really well-drawn panel. Yeah, I mean, but, even the kid in the first panel on, on page 10 is much better. Um, right, right, I, I think right. I think the key here, though, is that it's just so completely inconsistent. Like, right. if you look at the, the kid in the top panel of page 10, and then you go back to page 9, the bottom panel, and then the middle top panel, like, those are three different kids. Right, right. They, like, they, right. they really do look extremely different. Um, right. Like, the like the, the, the kid in the top middle panel has got, like, a Dracula Widow's Peak. Right. And a right, giant right. forehead. Like, it's just so, so drastically different. Um, and then again, scroll back up to um, page f- uh, seven. And this and, kid, and the kid in this, this circle is, is like this different is like, again. He's like buck toothed. Like, yeah, not really, but it's, already, I know. Yeah, he looks he looks like alfalfa or something. Yeah, yeah. Completely it's different. it's very inconsistent. Um, 
I think is the key uh, that um, that Jolie was, was trying to say as well is is that like it doesn't the art the art is fine because you can understand what's going on and it's not crazy busy but like it's not good either like it's the poses seem off the anatomy seems off the characters face face swaps from panel to panel um so mm -hmm. yeah i i think that i think that the art is not so great in a pretty good story so right. it's a shame that they don't um they don't match well yeah. you oh and go ahead julie thing that's like really that i think is kind of apparent from the way that he's the way that uh ron friends has drawn spider-man in this story is that there's like the, there's there's a dreariness for sure about the story. It's a story about death and remembrance. Mm -hmm. So there's there's this really like sad panel, the last one on the end of um, page six, where he's like sort of leaning, um, leaning on the windowsill, right, in, right. A, in a kind of exasperated sort of way. And there's several moments in here where Spider-Man's body language um, kind of translates or. Or um, you get that that feeling like he's exhausted, right? And that's I think that's that's something that kind of um, <laughs> I've projected onto myself, and I'm projecting into the comic as well. But it was just nice to read something finally that I could um, kind of latch onto, hmm. right? Or okay. relate to is just that that sense of wanting to like he's like just he wants to give hope in in a world where i've mostly given up mm, right. so yeah i don't know there's just there's something about the i don't know if we want to talk too much about like the, the subject matter it's pretty for something pretty heavy it's it's pretty like abc this is happening um or sorry spider-man sees this happening so he he does this knowing that this kid is going to die, but he doesn't say that to the kid. He just visits him. And course, yeah. the reader also doesn't find out until he um, kind of like, you know, swings away into the darkness. Mm -hmm. So it, it's just kind of, I don't know. It's hard to, it's hard to say because it's like almost a complete uh, 360 from what we're used to. Right. I've always thought this would, you know, if they were to adapt this, they couldn't. It wouldn't really fill up an episode of a TV show or fill up a movie. But I always right. imagined. I, I if, think that they actually do that in the Spider-Man oh, cartoon. Oh yes, we watched, the 90s they cartoon. do, and we'll be reviewing that soon. But uh, what mm. I was going to say is, if they were to do this in the movie, they could maybe, maybe like he could visit the kid once at the beginning of the movie, then again in the middle, and then the mm -hmm. very end of the movie could be the end of this story or something. I don't yeah. know, just an idea. Um, but here's the thing is, um, I, I want you guys, you know, you guys will be happy to know that artist Ron Friends is taking over Amazing Spider-Man in three issues. So, yeah, you'll be Ooh. reading at least 20 to 30 more <laughs> stories by him. But anyway, um, I did post this cover on Facebook, and I got a deluge of comments, all of them except two positive. And one of the people said, and I tend to agree, that his wife always thought the comics were for kids and then he gave her this story and this is what finally made her realize that they're capable of more um is this gi julie something that you would give to people uh that have any doubts about comic books mm, it wouldn't be the first thing that i grab to mm. say here here comics are for comics are for adults too it's like mm. well no it's just I would grab anything and give anybody anything because comics are for everybody. That that's well, that, that's just how I live. But like somebody who's like, oh, comics are for kids. No, I would not grab this. It would be now in maybe the pile of things that I would gravitate towards or mention, but it wouldn't be the first thing I grab. No. Josh, what about you? Um, I think I'd have to agree with Jolie. It is, I think, a more adult Spider-Man story, and maybe this is this would be one that I would throw in with, if, like, I was showing showing somebody how serious Spider-Man can be. But mm -hmm. um, I think that there's a very big misconception with 
not only comics but movies as well um it happens a lot in animation where people see animation and they think that it's a genre of right, film right and right, it's the right. same with comics like comic books is not a genre of book it's just the medium that the story is being told on you can have a horror comic you can have a comedy you right. can have a romance comic book like so it, it's it's really um comics are not just for kids and i i think that these these superhero hero stories are definitely the main target is for kids but it's not just um it's not just for kids it's anybody who enjoys these stories that's who they're for the people mm -hmm. that the people that are writing and, and drawing these are making them because that's what they love doing nobody's right. going to spend and d dedicate their entire lives doing something that like 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 this that they don't like doing so mm -hmm. um i i truly believe that that the people making these they're, they're doing it because it's something that they love and and if somebody loves something that much and they're willing to put their whole heart into creating it there's going to be people out there that also enjoy it and and feel the same way you're going to feel that like passion in the mm -hmm. stories so i i really don't think it matters what age demographic you're in you can enjoy these comics you know no that's that's a great great point um neil adams said something similar he said that when people try really hard to make something really good and they collaborate with other people that try to make something really good you're bound to make something that's really good you don't mm -hmm. produce you i mean even if it's not flawless you when, when when people are doing that you can't produce trash it's impossible right if you if you're working from the heart then you're gonna you know what comes from the heart goes to the heart and it, it's actually pretty closed-minded and ignorant for people to dismiss an entire medium because like you said nobody would do this if they didn't love it it's first of all comics don't pay well they never have right, right. You, you know it's like your reputation's down the toilet you know uh, if you do, at least back in these days. So it's like, what do you have to gain? You can only do it because you love it, right? And uh, right. I think that's a really, really good point. Um, I, I'll have to say, if I was a kid or a teenager, this is one of the first ones I would have picked. Now I've read so many other comics that would probably be a better choice, but I would definitely say this is a good uh, standalone Spider-Man story. If I just wanted mm -hmm. to say, okay, here's a quick Spider-Man story, just read it. And the good thing about it is, even though it's not perfect, and even though the art is definitely not perfect, it's a good enough story that, like we said, it's been adapted to a cartoon, and the very basic premise is so simple, you could take it and just redo it over and over and over again, right? Okay. In any cartoon, in any TV show, you could use this premise, and it would translate perfectly, I think. Mm -hmm. All right, so I definitely recommend it. Uh, Gia, Julie, do you recommend this issue? I recommend um, this issue, yes, to people who want to figure find out what happens to Thunderball, but also, <laughs> yeah, people who want to read a different story. Here's the thing. If somebody – this, I wouldn't give this to somebody who didn't take comics seriously. Mm -hmm. I would give this to somebody who knows nothing about Spider-Man. I wish this was the issue that I read first. Mm-hmm. Because mm -hmm. because this is the this is the Spider Man that mm -hmm. I am relating to, um, it not necessarily like someone else is going to be relating to him, but for some reason like, um, this this story resonates with me, so mm -hmm. I wish mm -hmm. this was the first story that I had ever read. Mm -hmm. So I recommend it to me. <laughs> Joshua Mervell, do you recommend this issue? Yeah, I, I would definitely recommend this issue. Um, I honestly, th I think that this issue and the previous one pair together mm -hmm. as like, read these, you really get um, Spider-Man in the previous issue being like the hero, uh, doing some detective work. He has to do some stuff with Jameson, I believe, in the previous issue. And then this one, we get some like really smart, fun fights with the end of uh, 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 the Wrecking Ball. Oh, I already forget his name. Uh, thunderball. Uh, thunderball thunderball right and then and then of, of course the ending you really feel you really see like the heart of spider-man and and really who he is and and what these stories can be and yeah i, I definitely recommend these ones all right and on that note we're gonna move to marvel team up uh, favorite 
Spidey comic. Uh, again, earlier we set this up. This is Assistant Editor's Month, and this is what I want to see from Assistant Editor's Month. I wish Marvel did more stuff like this before. Uh, we've got Marvel Team Up featuring Aunt May, Franklin Richards versus Galactus. And, um, and we've got a little spidey head in the top, and it says, what's going on here? This is supposed to be my comic. And it says, not a hoax, not a what if, not an imaginary story. And again, for context, um, there used to be so many imaginary stories back in the 1950s and 60s from D.C., that they started to promote stories that were outlandish by, by saying right on the cover, not a hoax, not a dream, not an imaginary story. And so Marvel is paying tribute to DC with that cover. <clears throat> but on that note, I'm going to pass it over to Josh because I know you love to talk about Marvel Team Up, Josh. Right. Uh... <laughs> Unless you want to switch me. Uh, Ooh. I, I mean, sure, yeah. If... if, <laughs> if you'd like i mean i feel like this one is the the one i could probably describe the quickest the okay <laughs> the you, quickest the you, best then i then i um th then the floor is yours all right well okay so we have galactus uh he is hungry and his herald <laughs> is a <ex> exhausted <laughs> <laughs> it's true he's hungry now his herald i believe is uh named nova yes nova Frankie um, Ray. is uh is exhausted can't find him any food so he decides that he needs to go find a different herald um to find him some lunch now uh then we catch up with peter parker he's with aunt may and mj as they're sitting down to watch the circus and who just happens to be sitting next to him Bes uh, uh, other than I don't know what I'm saying the Fantastic Four happens to be sitting next to them and Franklin Richards is sitting next to Aunt May and they're kind of chatting and they're having like a little cute conversation um, and Reed notices in the newspaper that there's something going on in uh, like o over on the west coast I can't remember exactly where so they have to leave right away Spider-Man notices this his spidey sense goes off so the four of them take off leaving Aunt May to watch Franklin Richards now uh, after they leave it turns out that Galactus is showing up and uh, he, he he's getting an energy reading that's very similar to Reed Richards so he goes to the circus and he tries to make Franklin one of his or his, one of his heralds and Aunt May who has been tasked uh, uh, tasked to watch him steps in front of the beam and accidentally becomes the herald of Galactus and after Galactus is he's hungry <laughs> Franklin says that he's got some Twinkies for him and, but um, but they're actually so, twinkles, right? Oh, twinkles, right? Yeah, I they're read twi it as Twinkies, and then I was like, wait a minute, they're actually spelling this Twinkles just for you know legal reasons. But just anyway, so, continue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're they're <laughs> Twinkies though. Yeah. Uh, so he becomes obsessed with Twinkies, and uh, Aunt May has to go around the entire world and collect literally every single Twinkie in existence to feed <laughs> to, to Galactus. Um, <laughs> He he eats them all and is still not satisfied. So they zoom up into space. Aunt May finds a an entire planet that is made out of Twinkies. Gal Galactus. Well, right, it is a Twinkie. It's a giant. Oh, it, it, right. In, sorry. In a plastic container, like a plastic package. Right. So he sinks in. He eats the entire thing. Aunt May returns back and uh, meets back up with the Fantastic Four and uh, spider-man and then galactus shows up and he wants even or he wants <laughs> and he says that uh he's wondering if they have a glass of milk to go with all the twinkies he's, he's eaten and spider-man <laughs> awakes from his dream or possibly nightmare and it turns out that everything that had just happened was a dream and then again um we have all of like the creators one by one kind of right. waking up in their hotel rooms uh, outside of the, the, the con that they're all at, realizing that what had happened was just all a nightmare. Uh, right, so and that's editor, really where the... Yeah, I just want to say quickly, editor Danny Fingeroth wakes up from Peter Parker's 
like the dream of Peter Parker. <laughs> right. Jim Shooter wakes up from the dream of Danny Fingroff. Stan Lee wakes up from the dream of Jim Shooter. Galactus wakes up from the dream of Stan Lee. <laughs> <laughs> and then at the very end it says, like we said, wake up. not a hoax, yeah, not oh. an emergency story, not a what if, but it is a dream. So, and that's <laughs> the joke. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's, I, I see, I, I really, I, I think it's really funny, and it's kind of like a cute story, mm. um, and like it's a nice what if, and I'm, I'm definitely glad that they kind of, uh, talk about it being kind of like a, I don't see the thing is they call it not an imaginary story, and then right. at the end it is end up it ends up being an imagine, imaginary story well, and it's just a dream right well no it's a dream those are two different things let's be clear right <laughs> but anyway but, okay but, but is is a dream not just your imagination well here's the thing it's a cheat when you're like, sleeping a, right anytime a like story it's... is a dream is a cheat i wish it would have been more like it really happened but they erased aunt may's memory or something right that would have been better right oh or, what <laughs> or even if they like did like an alternate universe like goof or something like it was right, just right 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 uh, yeah. yeah like it was I even like, like be... Galactus like looking looking at some sort of like computer where it's all the different universes as he's trying right. to find his new herald or something right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. here's I the thing know. this is an issue where I bought it as a kid and I always kept it and I always told people about it and I think it's a great idea <laughs> but I think right. it's a better it's a better i it's a better concept than the actual an actual story like let, just for the record it's written by Mike Carlin who's not really a writer he's an editor and i have a personal beef with him so i'm not but i'm not going to get into it but this issue wasn't bad but it also wasn't great like it probably took mm. a little bit too long to get started you know like there's a lot of a lot to sift through to get to the point of the story to uh, like to get through the setup but i think that once it goes i mean it's pretty funny you know like the way that the jokes kind of pile on each other. Like, I don't think you mentioned her name, Golden Oldie. You know, again, the, right. this, is, this is not, you know, top level humor, but it's definitely fun. And it's definitely when you've got three Spider-Man comics a month, there's nothing wrong with doing a story like this. However, it's definitely not a masterpiece. Like another writer could have written this exact same idea better, I think, you know? Yeah. Um, but G.I. Julie, what's your impression of the story? Okay. Um... I feel like we're on a, some kind of like Marvel team ups that I haven't hated with my <laughs> entire soul trail. Right. Because uh, what a glowing this... compliment. <laughs> right? It's sparkling. It twinkles. Um, this, the level of humor on the last page, like I lost my mind laughing. Right. Um, because what, after Stanley wakes up, he couldn't have just, he just, he's like, any true believer knows Galactus doesn't drink milk. Yeah, yeah. It's like, wait, wait, wait. And then they go so far as to have Galactus wake up from having <laughs> dreamed yeah. of Stanley. Yeah. Like, uh-huh. that was, that was the moment where I think I lost my shit. Uh-huh. <laughs> Girl, it was so funny. That, just that last page, though. You know, the thing is, is this is one of the, yeah, the, the last page is the best. When I, I actually posted this cover on a different page just to kind of get some reactions. And I posted the cover and the last page because the last page is the best part. Um, oh, yeah. And, you know, this is one of the things our friend Dale Jacobs actually spoke about is, is how one of the things that made Marvel so popular in the 60s and eventually what made them overcome DC and sales is the way that they really played up their creators as this family of people, right? that worked in this office together and they put them in the comics so that the readers would get to know them. And when I was reading this as a kid, this is one of the things that just made me love Marvel, right? You see mm-hmm. the editor, you see the artist, you see the Stan Lee. And, you know, again, not a, not a masterpiece, but this is one of those things that I really held close to my heart when I was a kid is stories like this. Yeah, like everyone is like, well, Marvel's more relatable. Marvel's mm. for the people. It is for the damn people because they have a dough boy making an endless supply of cream filled <laughs> planets. Right, like, right. That's the kind of stuff I want to read about. Maybe mm-hmm. not in like a Spider Man comic, but I want to read about that right. for sure. I think my eyes rolled right to the back of my brains when they, when she was like, I'm golden oldie. I'm like, oh, yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That was Whatever. Weird. 
but once they introduced the Twinkie element mm-hmm. to the story, the to the to the part of Galactus's hunger, I was like, where are they going with this? Right. This is amazing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just it's it's like a thousand levels of absurd. And right. I'm all I'm all about this kind of absurdity. Um, uh-huh. because these are what my fever dreams are. Right. I'm not feeding Galactus, but I'm definitely dreaming about Twinkies in space. <laughs> I I hope that this is this was the basis for that Aunt May movie that they wanted to make at Sony. <laughs> what? They actually made is that true? Yeah. Oh, wait, okay, yeah. So when they were so like a, a few years back before uh Spider-Man went to Sony, there was the Sony email leaks. Uh, of like everything uh, they, yes. that they were that they were that they were working on, they were apparently okay. working on an Aunt May origin film or a solo film, just about really? Aunt May. Yeah, mm-hmm. which is I, ridiculous. I uh, hope it would have been this. Me too. That would have been amazing <laughs> because maybe we would get a really good Fantastic Four movie out of it. <laughs> well. Here's the I thing. Um, I also want to quickly point out it's by a guest artist, Greg LaRock. I'm not sure if he's done anything that we've reviewed yet, but um, I thought the art was fine. Um, uh, yeah. Josh, what did you think of the art? Yeah, it was fun. I think I think it's um, a little bit more poppy, which is nice because of the 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 content of the story. Right. Like, I wouldn't want anything too like dark and gritty like we would normally get in like spectacular Spider-Man. Right. Besides, besides uh, this, this, this month's issue, of course. Um, like mm-hmm. it's, yeah, it's, it's fun. It's, it's, um, it, it works. I think it works with the story. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, to be honest, I don't exactly... think I, sorry. I don't think I really paid attention a whole lot to the art itself. Cause I was just too dumbfounded by what was going on. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like yeah, I just, yeah. Yeah. I just, I didn't, but, I but didn't it... even think about the art until right now. But it didn't. It, but it it did. It told the story and it didn't distract, right? So yes. Yeah. It did its job. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, Jolie, what'd you think of it? Oh yeah, it's it's good. It's fine. <laughs> it's um, it's definitely a comic. Um, uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> I don't like. I don't know. It's no, like... it's it's true. That's exactly. It's pretty much exactly how I feel. It, it's it's good. Yep. It's yeah. yep. It does what it needs to. Uh, the story is hel- okay. The story, it's like a bunch of people who, you know, how when someone tells you a serious story, but the entire story is made up of circumstances that are like ridiculous, right? But they're not laughing, right? But you are maybe the only one laughing. Yes. Um, those are all my what, dad's stories, anyway. <laughs> that's what this, that's what this is because it's yep. like, wait, 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 do you hear yourself? Are right. you listening to the words <laughs> that are yeah. coming out of your mouth? Okay. And then once we f- figured out that it was all a dream, I was like, oh. But it still was funny. Mm. But yeah, the art's good. Especially that Doughboy. Real good. Yeah, that's really Planet great. Twinkie. I, love, yep. I mm-hmm. love when he like he sees Galactus and his face is just like in complete. His face is just like in complete shock. And then he like gets on his hands and knees and he's like, I've prayed for you to come. Oh Lord, thank yep. you. <laughs> like he's just so happy that somebody's gonna finally eat this giant Twinkie. Right? And it's like it, oh, I'm sorry, the it's the scene where Galactus stands on the planet, Twinkie. It just and he slowly disappears <laughs> under the churning surface. Pulling from the world, it's very it, sorry. Every iota of energy, and and it's like you see the Twinkie surface sort of like engulf his mouth in the next one because it goes, it, it zooms in closer <laughs> to his face. It's like that's what I want. I want to die <laughs> surrounded in a. I want to die surrounded in like in a planet made of Twinkie. Like it's like a it's like a Homer Simpson moment, right. but it's Galactus, a planet eater who, in all seriousness, is like a very dangerous intergalactic creature. But they've added this like 
cute Kelly like element of Twinkies being a vice for him, and it's like I love it. Yep, me too. (laughs) It's exactly the kind of story that was written for me. (laughs) So, Josh, can you tell us is this story adapted into the '90s cartoon? Please tell us it is. (laughs) I do not think so. (laughs) I do not think so. I know that they. I I know that there is a point where they do fight Galactus. I can't remember if it's in the Spider-Man or if it's in the, in the Fantastic Four story, but I know that like everybody shows up to fight Galactus. Like Fantastic Four is there, the Avengers, Spider-Man, like a bunch of people show up and then it ends up being Ghost Rider at the end of the day who defeats him. But uh, okay. no, I don't remember Aunt May being there. <laughs> Damn. All right. Uh, obviously I recommend it. Josh, you recommend it? You know what? Yeah. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> uh, G.I. Julie, I'm assuming you uh, recommend it, right? Oh, no. No, not at all. Really? Um, uh, no, this is one of those private collection ones that mm. you like hope no one reads. <laughs> or finds out about, you know? It's like only for you. You I tell would people it. it exists, but... Of course, right. I'm gonna recommend you, it. Like you're, whatever. You you got like your golden oldie tattoo like hidden somewhere on your body that nobody else will see. Right in your ass crack. Yeah. <laughs> That's what all right. Is. So speaking of ass cracks, <laughs> let's move on to the. If you thought that was weird, now we're gonna move on to Peter Parker <sighs> the Spectacular Spider-Man '86. Okay. Now the gimmick for this issue is that again. This is back in the day when back in the days when Spider this was probably selling in the neighborhood of 2 to 300,000 copies a month. It was selling better than any comic published today. And they were right. so confident and they were so flippant about what they were putting out. They're like, "You know what? Let's just let a humor artist from a fanzine draw an entire issue of Spider-Man." Um so Fred Hembeck was known for doing again like i said humor magazines he eventually did do a couple spider Man. uh he did spider ham he uh-huh. you know he did right. like his own little uh little strip in in the uh bullpen bulletins and stuff but he's mainly known as a humor artist he did a one shot called uh jim shooter destroys the marvel universe things like that uh, first before we even jump into this uh gi <laughs> julie are you familiar with fred hembeck yeah i am okay uh josh yeah. are you Yes. Okay, that's good to know because, like, I yeah. remember, like, when, when we used to go to Detroit Comics, they actually put out, I think it was an essential edition of every single Marvel comic by Fred Hembeck. So I'm oh. glad that they haven't forgotten about him. You know, like, for if in my opinion, he should be like their their art, like an artist for life at Marvel, just doing like these little gag issues here and there. But, um, but GI Julie, do you want to uh, quickly summarize this issue for us? Sure. Um, so we see everybody in the bullpen. Um, it's, it, it, it kind of is like meta. Is that the right word for this? Yes. Meta textual. Yes. yes. Yeah. So we, instead of it being like starting off as an adventure, um, in Spider-Man's universe, it's the universe that creates the Spider-Man's universe, Spider-Man universe. So we're in the Marvel bullpen and, um, Al Milgram. Right. Is just he's upset because he has been um, passed over for this issue. Like he's not needed because all of the editors are gone. So sitting editor, assistant editor, is it Bob Di Natale? Yes. Who I I never really heard of, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, he's here. Uh, You Mm -hmm. see him. It's really funny because it's like, you've never heard of him, but now it's like, I've, I've seen him depicted. So, um, it, it, I think it's hilarious because he's barging towards uh, the editor, Denny Fingeroth's office, where Bob is, to give him what for about being um, just set aside for a month. And mm. uh, But he's also drawing this, so it's kind of... Awesome. Is he not? Yeah, yes. it's kind of yeah. It's hilarious. Al, yeah, Alan Milgram is actually drawing this. I really like <laughs> this art, by the way, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah. He, so they, they're they having a conversation and they're kind of like um, talking about where the editors are. And 
Bob Di Natale, Di Natale is like, well, this is this is what I want. Um, this is what I want to happen. We are going to just have, um, excuse me, Frank Hembeck do this issue. And it'll be great. And so Bob walks in. And just as Bob walks into the office, the art changes and it's Bob doing the art. So it's got that like signature curly Q elbows and knees. Fre- but you mean also- Fred? Fred. So- Fred? Yeah, did I say Fred, Bob? Of yeah, I did. Fred Hembeck, yeah. I mean, everybody's name was Bob in the 80s. <laughs> Bob or Dick. Mm-hmm. So, okay. So anyway, he comes strolling and he's like, here are my pages. And the story kind of starts. So the story now is kind of where we left off with Black Cat and Spider-Man, where we don't really know what the what's happening in their relationship. She just kind of flubbed a capture of what was the who who Hob was Hobgoblin? Hobgoblin. That's right. it. How could we forget? But it starts with the. But instead, um, we're starting kind of like maybe a new. Sorry, the storyline of their relationship in turmoil continues as we introduce or reintroduce a new villain called the fear the fly the right. fearsome fly. Is his name just the fly? It's just the fly. Yeah. Okay. So just the fly. So the fly comes in and, albeit hilariously, buzzes through because of just the way he's drawn. I mean, mm-hmm. anyway, um, he's hell bent on um, commandeering a ship full of garbage because he's a fly and he wants to eat garbage. <laughs> so that's his prerogative, and that's like the he's like eating. He, he's just happily, he gets it. Like, this is the first time I've seen, like, uh, where he a villain is able to do anything without his henchmen and right. just be, like, enjoying the spoils of, mm-hmm. um, of his wrongdoings, his villainousness. Um, and then while he's eating, he kind of... He kind of gets down on himself about being a fly. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like... Good God, I'm a mess. And he's just hes just reflecting. It causes him to reflect on why he is this way. Not only is he a man, but now he's a man. Like, he's like, why couldn't I have adapted the, like, um, the proportionate powers of a fly? I'm mm. becoming an insect, woe is me. So he's like, I must stop the people who did this. And on the longest of reaches, he... Um, he pinpoints Spider-Man and J. Jonah Jameson as the reason for his um, turmoil. So the, the uh, he he goes after them. So I, I I don't know. Should I go through why? Um, no. Well, I just think it's important to point out, but then uh, it, about the art style switch. But yeah, you don't. I mean, you can whatever you want. No, I mean, like, why the fly comes to the conclusion that J. Jonah Jameson in Spider-Man are the reasons for his turmoil. Sure, go ahead. Oh, okay. Well, um, J. Jonah Jameson paid a doctor named Harlan Stilwell, um, a doctor, to create the fly as kind of an adversary for this, for Spider-Man. Get it? The spider and the fly? Ha ha ha. Right. Anyway, that's it. So um, he fly, he buzzes away from his pile of garbage, um, and it kind of cuts to Black Cat and Spider-Man. And here's the thing. The art is so cartoonish and wonderful that for some reason, I don't know if the writer is different in this one, but they just talk about the relationship. They talk yeah. about what they talk about what Felicia wants, and it seems to be getting through to Peter. Mm. Like it never has before in the past, what, 10 to 50 I issues. cannot believe that more has happened in this story <laughs> than in the past, like, year of spectacular Spider-Man issues. Right? More has happened between these two in this issue alone. Just in a few pages of this goof comic that... Yeah. Right, right, right. It's like... It's like, I would rather favorite. everything look like this and just be this from now on. It's spectacular because this is so much better than what we've been getting. I can't right? believe it. Well, I can't I'll believe you, it. 
it, I'll tell you quickly. It is the same writer. It's Bill Mantlo. Huh. Uh, the other funny thing is, is they have less pages to tell the story because there's the you know there's the opening and the closing right the meta stuff. So yeah, it is funny that you're right. More seems to happen just, than in the past year of issues worth combined. It's so and it's so strange because. I feel for some reason I'm just I'm getting so much more from this. Mm-hmm. Um, even when the art style changes back and the the heightened drama with the fly, mm-hmm. even when that like concludes towards the end of the book, you still the the story still continues. Like it switches back to the art style. It, the fly is foiled. Spoiler alert. And not only is um, he foiled. But the black cat is able to help, and she doesn't get in the way mm-hmm. in a way that you would ex- that she has been written into um, the sort of action sequences as she was before. She um, grabs, <laughs> she is able to um, intercept a an, a rogue sandwich mm-hmm. and distract the fly because again he is a fly and he wants leftovers. So <laughs> she's able to kind of help Peter in a way right. um, that if this was drawn by Al Milgram, I don't think it would have worked because no. there's, there's almost like joke elements. Like it's, it's funny and non-serious, but it's still serious. But because it's drawn like this, I'm more accepting of the, the, the elements of ridiculousness, like the fly being constantly distracted by garbage or like garbage juice. Well, or I gotta what... say, the the funniest thing in the whole book is when he has to stop fighting J. Jonah Jameson to lick the pop that spilled on the desk. Yes. That and, is yeah. so funny. Yeah, he's like, wait, 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 wait. Yeah. And he's like, oh, foiled again. Like, <laughs> right, right. I, I can't resist. It's so funny. Um, but here's the thing is, I want to point out something ironic about this month's picks and that's mm. that the funny story with ant main galactus was drawn by greg larock a serious super artist and this story is relatively serious it was drawn by fred hembeck would it have worked better to flip those two or do you like the fact that they used a humor artist for this somewhat serious story josh um i i think that i like i like i think i liked it how it was Mm. I think that if it was reversed, I think if Marvel team up was in this style, um, I, I feel like the goofiness of Marvel team up kind of like amps up, right? Mm. It starts off almost, almost feeling like a normal comic and then gets ridiculous by the end. And if it was drawn like this from the beginning, I feel like you wouldn't get that. And it would just be like, Oh yeah, it's a funny, goofy story. I think that what made Marvel right. team up so ridiculous was that it was drawn like a superhero comic. And mm-hmm. then what made this one goofy was that it's kind of like a regular superhero story, but then drawn in this like extra amped up cartoony way. So right. uh, I feel like if it wasn't drawn like this, I don't think the fly would be stopping to lick the pop off of J- Jonah James' right. desk. Right. Or they would defeat him with a sandwich. I love, I loved it. This was so fun. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it made me wish that every issue of Spectacular was just like this. Hmm fascinating so maybe we'll have to dig up some more fred hembeck stories and see if we can slot them in somewhere eh? yeah yeah i would love to <laughs> honestly yeah I mean, again yeah this is another one that i had as a kid and i kept it just because it was so wacky you know like i just love the fact that they <laughs> would, would, would do that like again like the, the thing about comics in the 80s and the 90s is they could risk putting out stuff like this like there was a comic it was, it was a parody of Power Pack called Power Packaderms, you know, like a dolphin. <laughs> and it's just like they would just dump this stuff, not even advertise it. It would probably sell 100,000 copies just because everything Marvel put out was selling well, right? So it's just it's just a cool thing to know that they could take risks like this and get away mm. with it, you know? But nowadays, no way. You know, like everything has, has got to be so calculated nowadays because unfortunately nothing sells as well, you know? So Right. But yeah, I don't know. It's it's so strange. I feel like too. It's it does well. Well, I don't know how true that is though. Because didn't Jim Davis just come and do a Galactus story? Jim, I Davis. think just yeah, the yeah, guy like who Garfield. made Garfield. What? Yeah, 
Yeah, he just did. Really? He just did a story about Galactus. I think last year. Oh, he did, oh. and he's fat like Garfield, and he's eating yeah. a planet. Yeah, I have no idea. Yeah, wow, I'll have to look that yeah, up. So they okay. they do still they do still do fun stuff like this. Okay. Um, and, and I think that the key is that like the reason why it sells it's because it's a well known artist take like doing their take on this superhero story. Right. So they're right, right, right. You know, th- this really works because it's done in, in the artist's style. Mm-hmm. Um, and, mm-hmm. and not only the art, but how the story is told, like it's, it's a regular Spider-Man story, but just like fun is like pumped into it because this creator has kind of jumped in to tell their version of it. So like, right, right, right. Whether, whether this was assistant editors month or not, I feel like the story would be pretty much the same. Um, sure. Like I, I feel like the fly would still be there. He'd want to take revenge on J Jonah Jameson. Spider Man and Black Cat would still be talking about their relationship um, and work together to defeat the fly. But um, but uh, because uh, Fred Hembeck has like jumped on, it, he's kind of taken it and made his own take and twist on this like regular Spider Man story, and that's why it's so fun. And I think that's right. why people enjoy it so much too, is because it's like the thing that they love from like being looked at from a different lens. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. Absolutely. And just to cut in, just in case anyone wanted to know it uh, about that Galactus story, it happened Mm -hmm. for, um, it was part of squirrel girl issue 26. Um, inside. And yeah. And for everybody who told me about to continue reading squirrel girl, I might just now, because the Galactus story that Jim Davis drew is a zine inside Squirrel Girl issue number twenty six called right. Galactus mm. Gags. Okay. So now I'm gonna have to read. Now I'm gonna have to go right back to Squirrel Girl because initially I didn't like it, but I don't know. That Ryan North has uh, some tricks up his sleeve. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, there is a checklist. If you guys, uh, if you're listening, go to MarvelFandom.com/slash/wiki/slash/assistant/editor. And a bunch of other stuff comes up, but you can easily Google this. But it lists all of the Assistant Editors Month uh, comics from this month. Again, I said that my favorite, personal favorite, has always been the one where the Avengers guest star in Late Night with David Letterman. I have that issue in my collection. I'll never sell it. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's some other cool ones, but nothing is quite as good as that or the two, the, the two funny Spider-Man ones we read this month. So definitely some good times. Um, Mm -hmm. which is a little bit of a relief because next month we're back to serious Spidey comics as the Hobgoblin returns. Uh, Mm -hmm. The Sandman fights Spidey and Peter Parker is unmasked to the Black Cat. So yeah, Josh, you can take it from here. Yeah, we want to thank you guys so much for listening to the podcast. It really helps when you leave us a review over on Apple Podcast, or you can drop us a line and tell uh, tell us what you think about the the show over at, at HCT. Spidercast on Twitter, and you can find us at the Spidercast or the Comic Book Syndicate pretty much anywhere else. Um, we are now on iHeartRadio. You can find us anywhere you can find podcasts. So, yeah, keep in touch. That's right. I'd like to thank uh, Comic Book Syndicate producer G.I. Jolie once again for joining us. Thank you, Jolie. Oh, you are very welcome. <laughs> Let me just see myself out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so until next Monday, this has been Here Comes the Spider Cat.